Please turn that off. Please turn that off. Okay, good, good, good afternoon, everyone. We're at Calvary Road Baptist Church Library. A uh, little bit of tech issues again. Uh, I apologize for that. I'm trying to get this thing straightened out. <clears throat> we are in uh, Monrovia, California, the People's Republic of California. We've had a clear day today for the first time in about a week. And uh, it's not nearly as hot as it's been this last week. Uh, and so we're doing, we're doing considerably better. I'm glad that you're here. If you, um, um, if you would like to be routinely notified when we have Zoom sessions, then uh, you can um, uh, be sure and, and um, like and share and all that kind of good stuff. You can, you can send me an, an email request of a question uh, you can, you can subscribe, um, and boy, I tell you what, this is messing me up. Um, all right. I would like to do something a little different today. Um, I would like to confess. I am now 70 years old. And I want to rehearse to you some of the experiences that I have had from my childhood on up to uh, my adulthood of this thing called uh, chastisement, <clears throat> uh, routinely called uh, back in the day spanking. Um, I was, as a child, um, wired to the place where I literally would bounce off the walls. Um, I was among the most high strung and energetic kids. Um, I don't think we, I don't think my family knew anybody that was more wired than I was. And, and my mom and dad spanked me every day. I have no recollection of ever being spanked without needing it, without deserving it, and without it in some way benefiting me. Uh, I was not a kid who was intentionally mean, <clears throat> but I remember wondering why I got in trouble so often. I, I, I'm wondering why I disobeyed my parents <clears throat> and wondering why um, I could not comply with the directives of my teachers. Uh, as soon as the teacher said, um, you know, don't look out that window, of course, I would look out that window to, to find out what it was she was telling me not to do. And that was my whole life. Um, I, had, uh, I had issues with uh, discipline at home, dis issues with discipline at school um, every day, every day. My, my brother, on the other hand, uh, born 18 years younger than me, um, is, um, did I say 18 years? I should say 18 months younger than me. And I'm getting a beeping here at my end, Carlos. Um, it's doing it again. And uh, are you there, Carlos? Yes, I'm here. I don't hear a beeping on our end. I'm getting some kind of, some kind of feedback. I hope it's not disturbing you folks. But my brother to... born 18 months younger than me. It was always a very um, well-behaved and mild mannered young guy. I remember when he was a very small child, um, my mom would just forget about him. He was just such a such a good kid and was so capable of, of keeping himself occupied and keeping himself uh, entertained that he honestly did not need another person in the room ever. You give him a bag of old fashioned clothespins or you give him a pair of needle nose pliers and a wire coat hanger, uh, and he's good for a whole day because he's making things and bending things around and, and minding his own business. Uh, I, on the other hand, I always had to have people around me and I always wanted to interact with people. And I, I, I simply did not have the discipline to keep my mouth shut and to be quiet. Um, and this went on um, my entire life. Uh, I remember when we were living in Florida from 1960 to 1965, uh, and I was, I was used to getting my backside busted um, once or twice a day at least. 
Um, and and uh, I never felt grieved. I never felt that I was being treated unjustly. I, I was always aware that the spankings that I received was for misconduct of some kind. It was later on in life I would realize that the two biblical criteria for uh, parents disciplining a child are for disobedience, that is to say rebellion, uh, and, and foolishness. Um, so whenever a child engages in, in conduct that they have specifically been told not to do, you know, where, where a child is reaching for something and mom or dad says no, and the child looks at mom and then reaches anyway, bang, that, that should be met with a spanking. On the other hand, uh, sometimes because parents can't tell kids not to do everything, but sometimes kids just do things that are foolish, and uh, and and they need a, they need a whack on the backside for that. And the child will look to mom or dad. Well, you never told me not to. And the appropriate response from a mom or a dad is, is, is son, uh, there there are some things that are so foolish that you, you shouldn't need to be told not to do that. And so uh, those are the two biblical criteria, a rebellion on the part of a child toward parents and, and foolish conduct and behavior. And so uh, that's all I ever saw, that's all I ever dealt with because you, you cannot uh, reason with an unreasonable child. Uh, so many parents these days, they, they really try very hard in their naive and dysfunctional approach to parenting. They try to reason with an unreasonable child. Now think about that. You cannot reason with an unreasonable child. Um, and so, um, you know, God knows what he's doing and God knew this and you, you can't reason a, a, with an unreasonable child. And, and so I was one of these kids that you could never reason with because I was unreasonable. I, I was simply um, uh, physiologically out of control. My metabolism was such that I was incapable of controlling myself. And, um, but I, I, I received a lesson when we were living in Florida because across the street from me, there was a boy uh, a couple of years older than me. He was a big athletic kid. I liked him an awful lot. And uh, uh, he was like, I think about two years older than me. He had a, he had a sister that was younger than me. And, and his mom and dad uh, employed something in dealing with him that I had never seen before. It would not have worked with me. Maybe my parents attempted to employ this approach with me, uh, but because I was not uh, a youngster that this would work on, um, they may have tried it a couple of times without me realizing. But uh, when Ernie would do something that was inappropriate or uh, contrary to his parents' will, and I, and I saw basically his mother, and I, I was there in the home a couple of times when his mother would say, Ernie, did you, you know, do such and such? And he'd say, yes, mom, I did. And she would say something like, um, Ernie, do you recall I told you not to do that? And he would say, yes, ma'am, you told me not to do that. And then she would look at him and say, Ernie, that's disappointing. Um, I've come to feel that I can expect better from you. And so that's really disappointing to me. And Ernie was such a tender hearted young man and I think he's probably, you know, 12 or 13 at the time. I was, I was like 10 at the time. And, and was tenderhearted enough that when his mother would appeal to him and, and reason with him, he, his, his conscience was not seared like mine was, uh, that it would break his heart. It would melt him. And, and, and the tears would course down his cheeks. And, and I had looked at Ernie, and, and he was a big, tough, athletic guy. And he was nobody's sissy. He was nobody's wimp. Nobody messed with Ernie. But I thought, you know, what a loser. Basically, I, I, I was arrogant toward a guy who was a better person than I was. Um, I was operating with a, a seared conscience. I was really hard, really callous 
very difficult to deal with, uh, not because I wanted to be mean, but because I was kind of thick in the head and not very wise, you know, quite a foolish kid. And the only thing that would uh, influence my conduct was pain. Uh, the only thing that would cause me to take pause was uh, when somebody, when my mom or dad would, would set my tail on fire. Uh, when, uh, when nobody, nobody got through to me by reasoning with me because I was unreasonable. But, but Ernie was a guy that his parents didn't need to resort to spanking him because he was a tender young man. And so they dealt with him. So when parents have a child who can be talked to, then obviously you talk to the child who can be talked to, you reason with the child who can be reasoned with, and you correct them and you coach them and you instruct them uh, and bring them to a place of sorrow for their rebellion or their, or their folly. Um, and you can see the physical evidence, there, there, there will be tears. If on the other hand, you're dealing with someone like me, um, you employ the means that God provided for parents um, to bring the child to, to the closest approximation of repentance that is possible, short of conversion to Christ. So what do you do with a child who is sinning? And excuse me, but re rebelling against your parents doing what they tell you not to and not doing what they tell you to do, that's called sinning. Uh, and when you do things that are just crazy, just nuts, I remember Lonnie used to stick things in the electric socket and get jolted. That's just foolish. Uh, and rightly so, his parents would, would, uh, would, uh, would spank him, make, you know, spank him to tears. And, uh, uh, but with someone like me, it, it, required, it required a good spanking. Now, the Bible um, cautions parents against a child who's clever. Uh, you know, there's some kids that when you correct them and you, and you give them a swat, and as soon as it hits their backside at once, they'll just, and they'll, they'll, and they'll act out like, uh, like it really hurts and they're really sorry. The Bible specifically says, let not thy soul spare for his crying. In other words, um, you give to the child what the child needs, regardless of the reaction that they are generating to get you to stop. Um, uh, some, some kids, as soon as mom uh, swats them one time, they immediately start wailing and crying like they're brokenhearted and like, and like they're experiencing great pain and, oh, mommy, I won't do it again. And parents naively allow their children to get away with that play acting, and they haven't corrected the child at all. So parents have to exercise real wisdom. So as I say, I was one of these kids that got spanked once or twice a day. Um, I wasn't a mean kid. I wasn't cruel with anybody. Uh, but but I, I, I was, I, looking back on it, I was physiologically incapable of obedience. And then along about, uh, I, I th it was 13 years of age. I turned 13. We're now living in Oregon. And my dad made the statement to me. He says, son, you're 13 years of age now. You're too old to spank. And so I'm not going to spank you anymore. And I thought at the time that my dad said that, that what he said was erroneous. Uh, I did not agree with him that because I had turned 13, uh, I should therefore be immune from spanking. I thought, he, I thought he was wrong. I thought he was mistaken. I didn't say anything, but I remember the thought running through my mind, uh, my dad has just made a mistake. Um, he has overestimated me. He thinks that just because I've reached a certain age, <clears throat> that certain tools that God has made available to parents should no longer be employed when dealing with me. Now, we weren't a Christian home. I wasn't thinking about God, but I do recall in my mind thinking, my dad has just made a mistake. A couple of weeks later, my, <clears throat> I'm in the kitchen, <clears throat> and, um, and my mom came in, and she made a comment to me, and I got along really well with my mom most of the time. She was the one that spanked me most often, but I never held anything against her because I never thought I ever got a spanking that I didn't deserve. 
I think there were times that I should have been spanked that I wasn't spanked because they never caught me. Uh, but I never recall uh, believing or thinking that my parents were too hard on me. Uh, <clears throat> so my mom gave me a caution about something. And I turned to her, I think I was eating a snack or something. I turned to her, I said, well, you know, I'm 13 now. And uh, dad says, I'm too old to spank. And she, she's probably as far away from me as the camera is. And without so much as a hesitation, she reached up and smacked me right across the face. And, you know, I'm, I'm a couple of inches taller than her by this time. And she, man, she whacks me right across the face. And it was, did she hurt me? No. Uh, did she harm me? No. Did she surprise me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She slapped me good. And my face was burning from where she had smacked me. And she said, I'm your mother. And uh, I remember years later, I, I brought that to her attention. She has no memory of it. <laughs> but I, I'll remember it until the day I die, <clears throat> because I think it was exactly the appropriate thing, uh, exactly the appropriate timing to deal with an insolent son who was giving his mother a little bit of back talk. And she wasn't going to put up with it. And so um, uh, those were my experiences as, as a lad before I came to Christ. Uh, advanced several years in 1974, um, the Lord saved me. And um, uh, about, oh my goodness, about a year and a half after that, uh, Pam and I got married. And we're coming up on now our 45th wedding anniversary. <clears throat> and uh, we went off to Bible college, prepared for the ministry, responded to the call to the ministry. Um, and um, uh, then after, after um, graduating from Bible college and then going to graduate school for a year, I uh, was asked by my pastor if I wanted to go preach at a certain place. And I said, sure. And he said, uh, and he gave it to me, uh, the, the contact information. And, um, and then he said, oh, by the way, John, uh, you're going to want to be careful. And I said, why? He said, um, I hear tell it's a woman run church. Okay. So my wife and I drove to Brawley, California, and I preached at the church there uh, Sunday morning and Sunday night. And sure enough, it was a woman run church. Uh, there were uh, two or three women that controlled everything. Uh, because the guys let them. And uh, uh, they asked me if I would come back a week later. Um, and so I came back a week later. Uh, the church called me unanimously to become their pastor. And a couple of weeks after that, I became the pastor and, and conducted the first service. And on a Sunday morning, uh, during the Sunday school hour, I showed up and um, there was a woman there and um, I had met her before, but I had no idea what she was doing. And uh, I, I stood and walked to the front of the auditorium and she's standing there. And she said, um, uh, I said, what, what, are you, what are you doing? And she said, um, I'm getting ready to teach the adult Bible class. And I said, um, why are you doing that? And she said, well, there are no men here who will do it. And I said, well, there's a man here now. And she went and sat down. And I think that was the last service that she ever attended. Well, anyway, it was, it was during my pastorate in Brawley, California, that our church started a Christian school. <clears throat> and um, during the first year of our Christian school, we had a we had a mom who enrolled all three of her children in school, and, and uh, she came to me one day and said, I, I want to enroll my kids in the school. And I said, yeah, uh, so let's talk about why do you want to do that? She said, well, I, uh, I went to my daughter's class uh, yesterday, and uh, I picked my daughter up from school and brought her home, and she said, um, teacher was late today. And I said, really? And my daughter said, yeah, she said her boyfriend forgot to set the alarm. Whoa, public school teacher 
<clears throat> admitting to living with uh, a guy she's not married to. So the mother was very alarmed about that. And she immediately set about to find a Christian school for her three children to go to. Nowadays, uh, par the parents don't care. But anyway, she enrolled her three kids in our school. Uh, she had a boy and then uh, a second son. And then the youngest was the little girl. And uh, one day, the second boy, who was uh, quite a wild one, he reminded me so much of me. He was a real discipline issue for his dad and his mom. And he was a good natured kid like me. He was just absolutely wired. And I remember one day, <clears throat> He got in trouble at school and it was it was necessary appropriate and according to the rules that he get swats reached out to his mother and said uh so this is a situation and just want to let you know uh and so the plan will be to to give your son swats and she said okay no problem so i i brought the boy into my office and i had a big window so that you know you could see through it so that we weren't isolated or anything and nobody could hear what was going on inside, but people could see in my office. And the boy was 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 just a, a long legged, long armed kid, slender kid, very athletic, and he wasn't going to let anybody spank him. And um, and I said, well, I you know I'm uh, I said David, I'm I'm not going to wrestle with you. Uh, I'm not going to fight you. Uh, have a seat. I'm not going to spank you um, until you comply. Um, and so he sat down and we talked and I did some work and we talked and I did some work and, and he started whining. He says, well, you, what you, I said, I said, uh, you're, you're, you're being disobedient. You're being disrespectful. And what's appropriate is that you get swats. And, is it going to be hard? And I said, yeah, it's, it's going to be hard, but there was no emotion. And after a few minutes, he said, I need to go to the bathroom. I said, um, no, I don't think so. Let me give you the swats and then you can go to the bathroom. Well, I don't want you to give me swats. I said, well, okay, then just remain seated there. And after a few minutes, he said, no, I need to go to the bathroom. And I said, okay, let me give you the swats. You can go to the bathroom. And uh, uh, he said, uh, <laughs> finally, he said, okay. And I said, now I need for you to, I need for you to stand up. And I need for you to bend over. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to give you a swat, and and then I'm going to give you another one, and I, I think I gave him a total of five. He said, "Are they going to be hard?" And I said, "Yeah, they're going to be hard." And so I gave him a good one, and it was oh, and uh, and he teared up a little bit, and I said, "Are you ready for the second one?" And he calmed down a little. He said, "Okay," and I gave him the second one. And we went through that procedure and he got his five swats. Long story short, I never had to swat the kid again. And when the Lord called me up to my present pastorate, this boy gave to me his pen knife. It was his most prized possession. He loved me and he liked me and he knew that I loved him because according to Hebrews chapter 12, one of the ways a father or a father figure demonstrates love to a child is chastisement. Um, it's, a, it's a reinforcement of love between an authority figure, a parental authority figure type, um, and a child. And so to this day, uh, we're Facebook friends, and we get along great, and uh, I love him, and uh, he loves me, and he likes me. So I came up here to, um, to where I currently am pastoring in Monrovia, California. I'm uh, coming up on 35 years. And I remember the very first day that I was sitting in this office and I got a, I got a knock on my door and uh, the knock was by the biggest um, kid in the school. He was a senior, very athletic. I have absolutely no doubt that the guy could have played division one football. He was a tremendous athlete, really big guy, very, very fast. This kid was a stud and uh, he was the deacon's son. And uh, so he came in and uh, he said, uh, pastor, I said, yes. He said, I'm so-and-so he introduced himself to me. And he said, uh, you're supposed to give me SWATs. Here's the paper. And, he, and I looked at it, SWATs. And uh, he said, and here's the paddle. 
<clears throat> and I said, well, I won't be needing that. And I reached into the drawer of my desk and I pulled out one of these. Now this is a 15 inch long schedule 40 PVC pipe. It weighs less than one ounce. It is almost impossible to actually physically damage someone with this when it is used the right way with the right attitude at the right location. So I pulled it out and I said, I'm not gonna need the pedal. And he said, well, what's that? I said, son, this is the match that is gonna set your tail on fire. And he, what? I said, uh, so you're a senior, right? He said, yes. And um, I said, so you've had geometry, right? He said, yes, sir, I have. I said, okay, uh, put your hands in your pockets. And he said, what? I said, pretty clear, pretty straightforward. Put your hands in your pockets. He said, okay. I said, and you've had geometry, right? He said, yes. I said, now make a right angle. He said, what? I said, do you know what a right angle is? He said, yes, sir. I said, make one, bend over. So he had his hands in his pockets and he bent over. And of course that stretched the cloth <laughs> across his backside pretty tight. And uh, so I, I walked up to him and I did a Bjorn Borg. I did, I did an upstroke on his backside with this thing, just basically a flip with my wrist. I mean, I didn't, I didn't lay into him or anything, uh, but it, it lit him up and he, oh, and I said, did that sting? And he, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, uh, that's one. And then I did, that's two. That's three. That's four. That's five. Now I did five, uh, never went past five because I remember consulting with um, an attorney. He said, you know, pastor, uh, there has been no, there has been no Christian school in the United States that has ever lost a lawsuit um, if they have administered SWATs uh, numbering five or fewer. I said, okay, that's what we're going to do. Five or fewer, it'll never be more than five. Uh, and I will never administer SWATs to a girl. It was always a female staff member doing that. And so, uh, that was my experience with SWATs at my first pastorate with a, a reasonable, rational, low-key, no emotion, no anger, no emotion of any kind. And the same kind of thing with this, with this lad when I arrived here. The reason he got SWATs is he was testing me. He had intentionally done something that he knew would result in SWATs. And so he wanted to be the first one to get SWATs from the new pastor. Um, and so I gave him to him. And the funny thing was, this was in, in November of 1985. There was not a single boy came to my office the rest of the school year in need of SWATs because the word had gotten around. Yeah, this, 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 uh, this stings. <laughs> and so, and so they stopped. So, um, I, I began to formulate my, uh, concept and, and understanding, uh, of, of, um, of chastising as I studied the Bible and as my wife and I began to uh, more earnestly um, uh, seek to adopt a child because we'd been married for 12 years without children. So we wanted to be, we wanted to be parents. And so we studied it and, and we learned and we, and we prayed real hard. And uh, God brought a guy into our life who introduced us to someone who introduced us to someone. Long story short, we, we adopted our daughter and, uh, uh, and so at this point, I, I want to confess to you something that I did um, that was, was uh, and these things that I did 30 plus years ago are probably thought by some law enforcement agencies to be assault on a child. Um, and I'm sure that if you don't believe in God and you assume that children are not given to parents by God to raise them the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, then of course parents have no authority to administer discipline. But if you believe the Bible and you believe that God authorizes parents 
to raise children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And God wants children to be trained to understand consequences. Um, and God has given to parents uh, techniques to use to help train their children to understand consequences, to teach them the meaning of the word no, the consequence for foolish behavior, the consequence for overt rebellion, these kinds of things. And so I, I would employ those things and, and uh, in, in the Christian school, always with the knowledge of the parents, always with the consent of the parents. And then one day the attorney called me up and said, you know, you probably shouldn't do that anymore. And I said, really, why not? He's a good friend of mine. He said, well, the tide is turning in the United States and um, uh, Christian schools are, um, are, are gradually the, the in loco parentis principle of standing in the stead of parents in a Christian school is being eroded uh, in case law in the United States. And he said, so I would advise you um, to no longer administer SWATs to kids. Um, and if a child needs it, then you might want to have the mother or the father come in and take care of that business. But um, my recommendation is that you don't do it anymore. Okay, fine. So my next uh, involvement with chastising children, so the first one was the chastisement of me by my parents. The second one was the chastisement of boys in the Christian schools of the, pa of the churches that I pastored. Uh, and then the third phase would be my wife and me being parents of our daughter. And, uh, <clears throat> and I remember um when she when she was a youngster and we began i began to pray about it and study it and think about it and search the scriptures and and uh, obviously you don't want to damage a child obviously you don't want to invoke harm uh, i thought that such devices uh you you, uh, you would never want to spank a child with your hand uh, you want the hand to be that with which you bestow obvious blessing to your child uh, you don't want to make your hand the source of pain or discomfort to your child. And so in the Bible, um, the, uh, the tool that God provided is a symbol of authority, the rod. And so uh, initially when Sarah was a little girl <laughs> and she needed a swat once in a great while, um, I would use a spaghetti spoon. Now this... Uh, to a little kid looks kind of ugly. It looks kind of, it looks kind of scary. Of course, she would get it on, on the back, right? Uh, I mean, we obviously, this is for scooping spaghetti, so we would never use that. And she would get, you know, two or three of these. And, and she would, you know, she would cry mostly because of the displeasure of her mom or the displeasure of her dad. But, but there was, there was a sting. And uh, we wanted our daughter to learn that there are consequences for rebellion and there are consequences for folly. And it was imperative that she learn the meaning of the word no. We are all answerable to authority figures and we must all learn that there are consequences and God's plan is for children to learn that there are consequences from their, from their parents. Uh, and they learn by parents not training them to disobey, but training them to obey. So if let's say, let's say I had a, I had a daughter and, and my daughter is reaching to do something that she knows I don't want her to do. And she'll look at me, no. And then if she does it again, I never said no a second time. I don't want to, I never wanted to train her to obey after I had told her no, 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 now obey. So it was always no once. And if she did it again, she got swats. Um, because I did not want to train my daughter to disobey, 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 obey. And that's what so many parents do when they have their escalating intensity of no, 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 I'm warning you. No, no, don't do that. Because whenever a parent is angry or agitated with their child, um, 
that is absolutely proof positive that they've waited too long to administer correction. You don't, you don't wait until you get mad to correct your child. You correct your child when your child signals the need for correction. So how does a child signal the need for correction? They disobey. The other way a child signals the need for correction is when they do something foolish. So a, a, a swats to a child should never be administered by a parent who's angry or a parent who gets angry because anger is an absolute guarantee that the mom or the dad have waited too long. And what, they're, what they end up doing is training their child to disobey, 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 obey. No, no, no. You want your child to learn how to obey. And this is what I did, you know, three decades ago. Haven't done this in a long, 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 long time, but I felt it appropriate today to acknowledge what I did back in the day when doing this was understood in our culture. And it was always understood in the Bible, and it is still understood to be okay in the Bible. Though if a neighbor finds out, or if somebody at the grocery store sees you correcting your child, oh my goodness, you're liable to get arrested. Uh, it's a terrible state that we find ourselves in in the United States of America. So this is what I would do when my, when my daughter got old enough. Um, I, would say, I would say to her, um, go get the rod. And she would immediately start tearing up and I'd say, go get it. And especially when you're dealing with a kid that's really active and really energetic, this would especially apply to boys, is that you make the process of correcting the child go very, very, very slowly. This is what I would, this is what I used to do. I would never advise parents on what they should do nowadays because of all the dangers and threats from the law. But back in the day when I used to do this, I would just slow the process down and make it go very, very, very slow. And so, and of course it's worse for a boy because they want to get this over with and get back outside and play and do all. So to slow things down is, is, wow, it's very difficult, very challenging for them to deal with. So my daughter would go get this. I, I don't think a parent should ever go get this. You send the child to go get this. And, and uh, if the child hides this, <laughs> you have another one. But anyway, um, the child goes and gets it and brings it back. And I would, I would sit down with, with my daughter and I would say, now, you know what you did wrong? And she would, I said, so tell me, what did you do wrong? Tell daddy what you did. And I wanted her to articulate as best she could precisely what it was that she had done wrong. And daddy told you not to do that, correct? But you did what daddy told you not to do, correct? Said, so daddy, because I love you, because I like you, and because I want you to learn to be obedient, uh, daddy is going to swat you. And of course, she would start tearing up. And then I would have her bend over and I would give her one of these on the backside. Oh, one or two or three or four, you know, however many. It would, it would never exceed five. And obviously, when I, was, when I was dealing with the boys, I always gave it to the boys harder because they were bigger, stronger, um, tougher. Uh, than, than I would ever uh, correct my daughter, but uh, she would cry and, um, and, and then she would turn and I would embrace her and I would hug her and I'd tell her how much daddy loves her. And I would pray for her that God would bless her and that she would improve in her ability to obey. Now, why is this important? Because what God wants from people is repentance. He wants us to repent of our sins, but an unsaved child is not capable of repenting of sins. And so the correction that is administered by dad, the correction that is administered by mom is the closest 
thing to repentance that you can bring a child short of conversion to Christ. And so if you want a child who does not have a seared conscience, this was my vote motivation back in the day. I did not want my daughter to have a seared conscience. Um, I, I did not want my daughter to be hard hearted. I wanted her to be tender. I wanted her to be kind. I wanted her to be obedient. And I recognized she was a different person than I was. She was much more tender hearted than I ever was. Uh, and I shudder to think what kind of a lad I would have ended up being had my parents allowed my conscience to be seared and seared again and seared again and my conscience being hardened and hardened and hardened and hardened by their refusal to chastise me. I'm so thankful in retrospect that my mom and dad brought me to tears as a way as the best way possible for somebody like me to be relatively tender-hearted, relatively uh, soft and and gentle of conscience, and then and then and I as I said I got it every day, and then puberty kicked in, and once once I reached once puberty started, um, I never displeased my parents again. They never felt the need to swat me again. And I realized, hold it a second, there's only two or three things that bug my parents. I'm just going to take care of the three things that bug them so they never have to be irritated with me again. I mean, okay, uh, how hard is it to make up your bed, clean up your room? How hard is it to empty the trash without being told? And I can't remember what the other thing was, mowing the lawn or something like that. But I just I just started doing the things that 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 my foot dragging would irritate them. Uh, and so I just took care of it. And so... Uh, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child, but the rod of reproof shall drive it far from him. I, I didn't come to Christ at that age, but I did wisen up substantially so that all of the, the, the three repeating issues that my parents always took issue with me, uh, they didn't make life hard for me, and they didn't place unreasonable demands on me. Uh, it's just that I was one of these kids that was that was really foolish and really hard-hearted and really insensitive. And so it caused me to become concerned uh, with this matter of discipline. And, and after I came to Christ, I became uh, a student of God's word and I became interested. And, and I, I wondered, what, what can a mom or a dad do who want their son or daughter to come to Christ? who really want to have an impact in seeing their son or daughter understand that there are consequences for sin, understand that there are consequences for foolishness. Um, the Bible commands children to honor their father and their mother, and no child will ever honor a father and a mother on their own. They have to be trained to honor their parents and being able to correct your child um, and, 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 and demonstrate Hebrews chapter 12, the love that you have for your child uh, that is demonstrated by your willingness to correct them, uh, to apply the board of education to the seat of knowledge, as it were, although I don't use a board of education, I use a rod of authority back in the day. I haven't done this probably in 30 years, but that's the way I used to do it. And so um, um, I, I find that nowadays um, um, the authorities are so eager to find fault with right doing and so eager to overlook wrongdoing that parents have to be wise. They have to be very discreet. And I found a whole generation of parents, uh, they, they completely misunderstand what parenting is all about. We have, some, we have some very wonderful people in our church and one of them is a, is a first grade teacher. And she told me, she said, pastor, you know, we have to teach parents now that it's okay to say no to their children. And I said, what? She said, yes, we're finding with each new class of, of kids who enroll in first grade, that the mothers actually believe that their role as a mother is to facilitate the desires of their child. And we have to teach the moms, it's okay to say no. 
That means there are kids that reach the age of five or six or seven and they don't know the meaning of the word no. They think that the adults in their orbit exist to facilitate them. That makes them, that, that, that raises a group of children with a sense of entitlement. I, I, do you think now we have the answers to the BLM people out there and the Antifa out there rioting and demanding and, and walking up to people who are eating outdoors at restaurants and cursing them and throwing tables over and throwing juvenile temper, temper tantrums because uh, they, were, they were almost certainly raised by parents who did not, and, and you got to do it by the time they reach the age of five. <laughs> After that, I'm sorry, it's too late. Um, teaching their children the meaning of the word no. And so that's my, that's my confession for today. That's how I did it. I, I, I always used a rod because it's very, very light. Um, I don't know that it ever left a mark on, on my daughter. Of course, I didn't. Um, I, 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 I didn't lean into her or anything. Uh, I wanted the spankings to sting her, not to harm her. Um, and, and chastisement is not something you do to a child. It's something you do for a child. And, and it is God who knows children better than anyone and understands that there needs to be a means whereby a mom or a father with loving kindness and tenderness, but with the determination to do right, they need to see that child come as close to repentance as possible in the days before the child is converted to Christ. And the means that God has provided to correct children and bring them to a place approximating repentance is the rod of correction, the rod of reproof to spank the child. And always without anger. If, you, if you're mad, you waited too long. You waited way too long. And then after the swats, you lay the rod down. You take the child into your arms. You embrace the child. Um, and, and you pray and you let the child know all is good between me and you now. N nothing for which I have just swatted you will ever be raised against you again. Because God tells us in Hebrews in two different places, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So if God forgives and forgets the sins of his children, then we need to learn how when we discipline our children to then forget the offense that led to the swats. So you, there, our children need to know that whenever we, whenever we spank them and they cry and we pray that we have started fresh and anew all over again. It's a new start and all is good. The air is cleared between daddy and the child between mom and the child and and the children are are happier uh, they are not guilt-ridden their conscience is not seared and i found that my daughter after she would get swats would go for for sometimes weeks with such a sweet spirit such a good attitude such love devotion and compliance to the reasonable uh, instructions and directions of mom and dad. So this is my confession. I felt like we live in such a different world and there are so many people uh, who don't know how it used to be done. And I'm, I'm an old timer, I'm 70. Uh, and so this is what I did a long time ago. Um, and um, uh, you say, well, why are you doing that now? Well, for two reasons. Number one, I'm past the statute of limitations. <laughs> And secondly, because I saw something on social media uh, that asked the question whether or not parents should be allowed to spank their children. Uh, excuse me, that is another illustration in my mind of governmental overreach. It's not whether parents are allowed to correct their children. Parents have been directed by God 
and given the means for that correction from God to deal with sin issues in the lives of the children he has loaned them. Our kids are not ours. They belong to God, and they need to be raised the way God wants them to be raised. Thank you for tuning in. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Remember, this happened a long time ago, so uh, understand um, this is the way I used to do it back in the day. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Father, for your goodness. Bless us. Give us wisdom, help us to do right, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.